Game development was always my passion. I started creating games a long time ago as an indie developer. And of course, the code in my first games was really bad, with no architecture whatsoever. So the perfectionist in me quickly realized that I needed to learn programming and architectural patterns to write well-organized, structured code. And so I started to consume a lot of materials, books, posts, conference talks, uh, and tried to apply as much as I could in practice. But still, I always dreamed of seeing how the most popular games in the world are made, what architecture they use, and how their developers structure their project and write their code. So, many years later, I'm ready to tell you how we develop our games, and not just one, but multiple of the biggest mobile games in the world right now. So, good afternoon, and welcome to my talk on the architecture behind our most popular games. Actually, I'm glad to see so many people here. Uh, happy, I'm happy that all of you are interested in the architecture of big games as I do. And who works with Unity here? Wow. <laughs> Other engines? Great. Uh, even though the games in focus today are made with Unity, the framework itself is engine agnostic, so you're in the right place to learn what challenges we face while working on our games and how we solve them. It's not working. Okay. <laughs> My name is Alex Merzlikin. I'm a game developer. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I'm a game developer with more than 10 years of experience. Right now I work at Playdica. <laughs> As a tech lead on one of the top grossing games in the world. And what is more, I've been working on multiple mobile casual hits throughout my career. And I'm the author of GameDev.Center. Go check it out after the talk to learn more about performance, optimization, and good coding practices. Here it is. <laughs> so, why do we need a good architecture? Let's first talk about actually what is a good architecture. Raise your hands who think that a good architecture should be very flexible, with a lot of abstractions, different layers, allowing to add changes and replace implementations almost in no time. All right, and who thinks that a good architecture is a bunch of singletons resulting in a very simple structure with no over-engineering? <laughs> Great, actually, all of you are right, because our project and goals... Yep. Actually, our project and goals define what is a good architecture. There is no silver bullet that fits all the projects and solves all the problems. And obviously, a project for a game jam or a hyper-casual prototype would have absolutely different requirements to the architecture compared to a real-time strategy game or a content-heavy mobile casual game that is scaling in production and is expected to be supported and growing for many, many years. So, why do we need a good architecture for our games? Playtica's long-standing, top-grossing games highlight the need for continuous play players' engagement through regular content updates. And today's top-grossing market shows the need for constant rollout of new features, meta changes, and more and more content every month. And as game developers, we all strive to create immersive and engaging experiences for our players. But as the complexity and dynamic nature of games continue to evolve, we are all faced with challenges when it comes to managing large amount of modules in our games, as well as keeping the code scalable, maintainable, allowing collaboration in big teams, and managing the growing complexity as game evolves. So that's where architecture comes in. By choosing the right architecture, we can optimize our game development flow and create better experiences for our players 
by improving and adding new functionality to our games easier. <laughs> and today, I want to introduce you to the hierarchical model view controller architecture and how it helps us to maintain and grow various games. The controller tree is a key component of HMVC and it helps to manage data flow in the game. You will be able to create more complex games and facilitate collaboration of many developers using this approach. And let's start with HMVC. It is an extension of traditional model view controller architecture and it offers more robust and flexible solution to the challenges faced by developers while working on the complex systems. By delegating tasks to child controllers, each of which is responsible for a specific part of the application. And the main difference to MVC here is that triads of model view controllers are structured into a tree. And controllers drive the data flow by spawning instances of child controllers and delegating the behavior and data processing to them. Instead of having many entry points where different systems depend on various separated MVC triads, we have a single entry point into the game. And when a particular controller is instantiated, it communicates with other systems to get the needed data. And the controller's tree refers to the hierarchical structure of controllers inside HMVC. And we use this term internally, the controller's tree, as the name of our HMVC pattern implementation. This structure helps to enforce a single entry point into the game, ensuring that all data flow is managed in a consistent and organized manner. The controller's tree also provides game developers to maintain separation of responsibilities between modules, making code more maintainable and easy to support. And let's look at our HMVC triad and isolation. Models and controllers are always plain C sharp objects, while views are mono behaviors that only provide Unity API and rendering capabilities with no game logic at all. What is more, multiple controllers might work and reference the same model or view. It means that we don't create a separate type of model and view for each controller. And we have an, a lot of controllers that don't have any view at all. For example, the controller that makes a server request and then updates the model without using any UI whatsoever. And the controller's tree was used across various games at Playdica and what is more, across various frameworks. Not all of these games were made with Unity. And to name the biggest ones, Board Kings, Best Fins, Solitaire Grand Harvest, Slotomania, Bingo Blitz, and many more smaller games. <laughs> and here are the metrics of our game in 2023 to show you the high pace of development. More than 40 people pushing changes to the client repo every day. We are able to release, we have more than 50 features uh, added the last year, and we are able to release new update every two weeks for many years. And what is more, between every release cycle, we have from one to three technical releases to test new functionality on smaller audience. And what is more, 100% of features utilize dynamic assets, so they can be reskinned for every event easily. And talking about events, we have an incredible live ops providing new events to our players daily. And let's dive deeper into the implementation details of Controller's Tree with the example of another game, Board Kings. Raise your hands who have seen this game before. All right, happy to see your hands. <laughs> And for those who don't know, BK is an online game uh, where you build your own board and also you can visit your friends to help them build their board or to destroy it. There are a lot of stuff to collect, like stickers, idols, buildings, and many more. We also have a rich meta game with live events being open to players consistently. So the core mechanic is a board and its management as well as visiting friends. We also have a lot of mini games. For example, the Steel Mini Game, that is a classical example 
of pick three game in which you have to guess where the biggest prize is. And it is launched in a separate scene. We also have a daily bonus in the form of a lucky wheel that is also launched in a separate scene. And an album with stickers that you can collect by playing the game or by exchanging with your friends. So, based on the example of these features, you can see why the architecture is called the controller's tree. There is a root object that creates our branches for each feature. For example, the controller that manages the board by spawning instances of child controllers, each doing its part of the job. For example, inst instantiating buildings, upgrading buildings, showing the UI, and so on. And the board right now also starts the still minigame branch, because the only way to trigger that minigame is to step on the particular tile on the board. And only one controller is needed to be launched to show the whole minigame flow, and it does its job by spawning instances of child controllers and delegating the whole flow to them. And the beauty of this approach is that we can decide giving out the still minigame as a reward and just start the single controller in another branch, for example, in the collect rewards pop-up, and that's it. What is more, each controller encapsulates game object's lifetime, preventing memory leaks by instantiating, using, and then destroying acquired game objects right away. Of course, for frequently used objects, we use pooling to avoid an excessive garbage collection. And raise your hands if one of the top crashes in your game is due to out-of-memory exceptions. All right, actually, <laughs> I expected more hands because it's a very familiar case uh, for our games uh, that have a lot of assets and a lot of content. And in many cases, the reason for it are resources that are not properly unloaded after being used. However, each controller encapsulates resource management as well. And all resources built in and dynamic ones are following the same approach. We load asset bundles during run time only when needed and unload them right away after being used preventing memory leaks, reducing memory consumption. We also have a tree viewer in the editor. It provides means to inspect what is currently active in the game, and also it provides easier debugging. And here's how our still mini game looks next to its tree. There are multiple controllers that are active all the time. For example, one of them listens to the event of the player stepping on the particular tile on the board. And once it's triggered, multiple controllers start and the branch continues to grow as subsequent game logic is executed. So we roll the dice, step on the tile, and you can see that controllers encapsulate async logic. And when they finish their job, they disappear from the tree, one by one. And the whole minigame is over and now all controllers are removed. And all resources that were acquired and loaded for this minigame are unloaded too. Now let's get even more technical and dive into the implementation details. Controllers are the entities that drive the whole game flow. And we have two types of controllers. The first one is the controller's base. Its life cycle is managed by its parent. It stops in two cases, when its parent stops or due to an exception. And actually, when any controller is stopped, all of its children are being recursively stopped too. And an example of a base controller can be the controller that listens to the event of the player stepping on the special minigame tile. So this controller will be active all the time while its parent board is active. And the second type is a controller with result. It extends the base one and obviously have a result that returns back to the parent when it finishes its job. And as an example of this controller, it can be a login controller that makes a server request and returns the data after that. And when the data is returned, the login controller stops itself. This type encapsulates an async operation. And another example of such controller can be the whole still minigame controller. It loads resources 
And when the whole minigame is over, it stops itself and unloads all the acquired resources. Controllers are asynchronous, so the result can be awaited in the parent using task or unit task, depending on the implementation. And our experience, as well as controllers to evolution inside the company shows that the simpler the controller's API is, the better the architecture and it's easier to use overall. These are the main methods of the controller's API and they all have the internal access modifier. And internal means that it is impossible to invoke, initialize, start, stop, or dispose from the outside of the controller's tree package, uh, without hacks, of course. And there are no public methods at all. We also restrict creating controllers via constructors and saving its instances. So the only way to start a new controller is to use the protected method execute. And protected means that you can invoke it only from another controller so that all new instances are inside the single tree structure and will be correctly processed when one of its branches or the whole tree is being stopped. The only exception to this is the root controller that is created in the app's entry point and it must have some public method so we can create it outside of the tree and actually start the tree itself. And execute encapsulates the controller's lifecycle and uses all internal methods under the hood, like initialize, start, stop, and dispose. And this approach allows to eliminate cases when developers misuse the API and create controllers that are not stopped or disposed properly. So the single method leaves no space for a mistake. We also have the protected property with the cancellation token. So at any, point, at any point in the controller's lifecycle, you can check if its async execution is cancelled. For example, we don't need to play a sequence of idle animations when a player clicks to close the feature immediately. So by checking the token, we can interrupt our async animation flow instantly. We also have other logic in controllers, and they are all located in private methods that are started in invoke and invoked in initialize. And here's the example how it's used in the code. We create a controller with result and await until it finishes the login sequence. After that, we can launch a base controller that in turn initializes groups of features. And that's how the tree grows by delegating the flow to child controllers. The root controller itself is created in the app's entry point, which can be a mono behavior or a static class with the initialize on load attribute. We manually create the root controller and invoke initialize and start because those methods are exposed as public API in the root controller. And it's responsibility to start the tree and delegate the flow to child controllers. In that case, it's high level controllers that initialize groups of other features. And let's talk about advantages this approach brings us. The controller's tree enforces a single entry point into the game, ensuring that all data flow is managed in a consistent and organized manner. A new controller can be created only inside a single existing tree. And of course, you can create multiple root controllers and create, therefore, multiple trees. But we found that the single tree is the most convenient approach. And the controller's tree allows for the logic in the game to be decoupled, making the code less tangled and easier to understand. What is more, multiple controllers can be developed and tested independently without having to worry about all the intricacies of other controllers. And it might lead to increased development process efficiency as you might work on multiple parts of the game at the same time without any conflicts, without any issues. And the structure of controller's tree promotes reusability as logic can be easily reused and shared across multiple features. And I personally hated in the past adding new items as a rewards in my games because it always required changing UI in every feature and a bunch of classes had to be modified to support new items. But now we have the common rewards controller that allows to give players items that they have purchased or earned by playing the game. And it really makes life a lot easier 
as all you have to do in your feature is to start the common reward controller and be sure that it already supports all existing items in your game. And what is more, you don't have to worry about any future items at all because they will be implemented in one place, in a reward controller, and your feature will support it automatically without any code changes in your features. And it's amazing because adding new items in big games like ours is really time-consuming process and also it's very error-prone. So the set of common controllers can cover a lot of general use cases in your app. Therefore, you might save a lot of time. What is more, the clear separation of responsibilities in the controllers tree makes it easier to support and update individual parts. And of course, a rewards controller would be a perfect example of maintainability. You don't have to change your feature code at all to support all the new items that we might add. The controller's tree helps ensure consistent implementation across modules as features have a similar structure. And what is more, developers get used to easily navigate, navigate inside any feature by inspecting the code and the flow is clearly seen in the code. So all features have a similar high-level structure. Of course, on lower levels, features differ a lot. That's normal. But for this, another advantage comes into play that greatly synergizes with the current one. The hierarchical structure of controllers tree provides a clear and organized flow for managing the data in the game, making it easier to understand and maintain over time. You can even create a static or on-time analysis tool that would capture all controllers and build the entire game tree graph in the editor, just like the one from the video of Board Kings. And such a tool helps you understand and investigate the game flow even easier. And how many of you had to dive into Memory Profiler to find sneaky memory leaks? All right, <laughs> what a great audience. Uh, because I'm personally keen on performance and optimizations, and I'm really happy that you are not only interested in the architecture, but you also have experience with Memory Profiler, so it means that you care about performance as I do. And the controller's tree greatly aligns with the resource acquisition is initialization pattern. And the basic idea behind this pattern is to tie the lifetime of a resource to the lifetime of an object. And this is done by acquiring resources in the initialize method and releasing them in dispose. So when any controller is stopped, all of the resources are automatically disposed. And this approach helps prevent resource leaks, which might occur when developers forget to release a resource or an exception happens before it is released. By using this approach, developers can ensure that all resources are properly managed even in the presence of exceptions. And talking about exceptions, try catch statements can be used on any layer of the tree, giving developers full control of where to stop the particular branch of the tree when exception happens. And paired with the previous point, we can be sure that when we stop any controller due to an exception, all of the resources loaded by it or its child controllers will be correctly processed and disposed. So in the end, the cognitive load on developers is lower. Now please raise your hands who have used dependency injection frameworks in your games. <laughs> oh, amazing. And how many of you had uh, issues with long startup times? All right. It actually, <laughs> it's a very common case for big games. Uh, it's usually not a problem in the beginning, but as the game continued to grow, uh, at one point we always hit this issue. And uh, due to the isolated nature of modules in the controllers tree, it is possible to have multiple subcontainers. It means that you can bind and resolve features as needed in a lazy manner, leading to better resolution times, better memory management, and therefore better performance. What is more, it adds one more layer of encapsulation, as you cannot inject types that are bound to different subcontexts. So once again, all the communication between multiple features 
must be thoroughly thought through and well defined via interfaces, leading to better structured code and there will be less chances of circular dependencies that might lead to spaghetti code. And what is more, using this approach doesn't mean that you must use it all the way for each feature for each piece of code. Uh, for example, you can combine it easily with other architectures for some of its parts, like ECS that can be implemented for just particular mechanic or a particular feature, and you can launch the ECS world just in its own feature controller so that ECS part will be completely encapsulated inside own subtree and launched only when needed, saving resources. We talked about advantages, now let's add some disadvantages, because obviously we have some. While the controller's tree doesn't require an excessive amount of boilerplate, there are still some components that are necessary for facilitating the infrastructure of the tree. For example, an arguments class that is implemented for each type of controller and passed as a payload. However, to simplify the process of writing boilerplate code, we can utilize different techniques like live templates in Rider, code generation, attributes, and even AI tools. And by the way, who is using any sort of AI assistance in your daily work? Wow, great. We definitely should catch up after the talk and share our experience. I would love to hear how you use it and how it helps you. If you need an interaction between multiple features, then it cannot be done directly between two controllers because controllers have no public methods at all. And the absence of direct communication may be considered as a controversial drawback at first glance. On one hand, to provide communication between multiple controllers, we need some sort of mediators. We have chosen creating models like in the slide. It contains only events and methods to invoke these events. So there is no other logic, and one controller listens to the event, another just invokes it using the method. And uh, on the other hand, creating such uh, mediators allows for a thoughtful consideration of dependencies and what will be their directions between our modules. In addition, allowing direct communication might cause other architectural issues, such as injecting controller instances into each other. It means that, in that case, we would need to bind some controller types as singletons, and it might lead to other architectural issues, making controllers less flexible and blocking the ability to start multiple controllers of the same type in parallel. So in our implementation, all controllers are bound as transient. So for some, including myself, the lack of direct communication can be considered even as an advantage. Because once again, all communication between features must be well-defined via interfaces, and it will be strictly limited via code review and assembly definitions to prevent circular dependencies that might lead to spaghetti code. Nevertheless, it's worth noting that it is a significant restriction of this architecture and its controversial nature should not be ignored. Because there are no public methods in controllers, it means that you cannot test any method in isolation. You can run only the whole controller. Obviously, we can move all our business logic into models and make controllers just invoke model methods. And models are plain C-sharp objects and they are absolutely unit testable, they can be tested a lot easier than controllers. But in practice, you would always still have some parts of business logic leaking into controllers anyway. And it also leads us to an argument where business logic should be located when using MVC, in controllers or in models. Of course, we have some workarounds how to test controllers. For example, we can introduce an interface just for the purpose of unit testing or we can use the reflection, we can use the attribute in internal visible too. But I find all these approaches as not a really great practice. For example, in one of our project, projects, we have 
public API, initialize, start, stop, and dispose, exposed as public API. Therefore, we might create controllers in tests as we wish and run them, then check the result and assert that it is as expected. But if you can use lifecycle methods in your test code, it also means that you can use it in production too, leading to various mistakes where controllers were not stopped or disposed correctly. So that's why the single method execute helps to solve this issue and very, very useful to prevent any resource leaks. What is more, controller is a reference type, and while it's not really that heavy, it still adds some overhead and adds garbage collection pressure. It's not a problem in our case, as new instances are instantiated pretty rarely, but if used incorrectly to spawn many instances, every frame, it might become an issue. And it highlights once again that this architecture should not be used blindly. Now let's talk about some advice that we have collected while working with the controller stream. The editor tool is essential if you use HMVC, like the same editor that was used in the video of Board Kings. It provides means to inspect what is currently active in the game by showing each controller. Additionally, it allows to see each controller's state by reflecting its properties and fields. What is more, we are able to invoke any lifecycle method or debug methods marked with a special attribute. It makes the debugging and testing a smoother process. Furthermore, the clear flow through the application makes it possible to create a static analysis tool. And this tool can build you the entire game tree in the editor time without running the game. And it can be especially useful because some features are really hard to reproduce. Some features have complex flows and also they might require complex configuration. So raise your hands if you have, uh, if you ever had to ask other developers or QA engineers to help you set up any feature. All right, <laughs> I have done it many, many times. And um, of course, in our company, we always strive to create configurations that are as simple as possible. But we still have some features like the farm or the album that are incredibly big with hundreds of items with a lot of complex flows resulting in a very complicated configuration. So only our amazing QA engineers know how to set it up. So with this tool, you might save a lot of time. And what is more, you will save time of your peers. Our development methodology emphasizes writing clear and organized code, following code-centric approach and adopting a passive view variation of MVC. It means that the controller is responsible for communication between model and view. And we strive to keep our views as thin as possible. As demonstrated in this slide, you can see that our monobehears provide only serialized fields so you can set them up in the editor and methods that only invoke Unity API without any business logic. And by separating business logic from views, we can test, unit test our code easier as models are plain C-sharp objects and they are a lot easier to unit tests compared to views. And given the main principle of HMVC to split and delegate tasks to child controllers, we can see how it greatly aligns with the single responsibility principle. And a lot of controllers each with only one responsibility are a lot easier to support and maintain compared to one module doing all the work without splitting. And of course, using this approach doesn't block you from writing code that follows all other solid principles. Some controllers listening to particular events to show its full screen animation just like this steel minigame controller that awaits until player steps on a particular tile on the board. But what can go wrong in that case? We might have multiple features listening to the same event 
to show its full screen animation. And we definitely don't want them overlapping, just like in the slide. So we need a mechanism that would control what is currently being shown on the screen. And of course, we have multiple solutions to this problem, and all of them are highly dependent on the specifics of your project. For example, some projects implement a state machine on top of the controller's tree so that new controllers are instantiated one by one from the stack when needed. Other projects implement an async queue that works like a semaphore, allowing only one controller to manage what is currently being shown on the screen, and other controllers await its turn. So each approach has its pros and cons, so should be carefully considered based on your project and your specifics. And to wrap up, here are the key takeaways from today's talk. Don't trust anyone. Always do your own research when applying any approach, especially when we talk about architectural patterns, because wrong decisions might bite you when it's way too late to fix architectural problems and replace your implementation and architecture. The controller's tree is not an ideal architecture that fits all the projects and solves all the problems. However, it helps facilitate the development in a really big teams on content and meta-heavy games that are growing in production for many, many years due to constant rollout of new updates and new features being added at a really high pace. And a wide variety of games in the top charts of mobile stores prove this benefit. In your next project, I highly encourage you to evaluate the controller's tree approach and analyze if it fits your project. Or you can even design only one feature in your existing project as this approach is not versatile enough to support other architectures as part of it, like the ECS example before, but it's also versatile enough to be started into it, its own entry point as a, one feature in existing game. And actually we have multiple examples where big and successful games were refactored into this approach one small step at a time. Refactoring features into its own sub-branches one by one and adding new functionality, completely following the controller's tree approach. And while still being able to release new updates every two weeks without any delays. So I would be happy to hear about your experience with the controller's tree approach and it would be great to see other types of projects that benefit from controller's tree. So let's connect. And also let's meet up today. I would love to hear about your games, your architecture, and your workflows. So thank you very much and have a very, very great rest of the day.